Hello, hello, hello. How are you guys doing tonight? It is 11.49 p.m. on this beautiful Midwestern Indiana night, Tuesday night. It is 75 degrees. It's muggy outside, but it feels good. And there's kind of like a little bit of a breeze outside. It's been a good night. To my meeting tonight and stuff. I'll talk about that in a second. But um, picked up Tanya Jean and our friend. And we got laughing so hard on the way home. But... Um, I gonna say got up today went and had uh, went and got coffee drove ran had a bunch of errands I had to run listen to my audiobook so all, I listen to my audiobook all day today I'm so into this audiobook you guys and um, it's lock every door by Riley Sager I found out that Riley Sager is actually a pseudonym for this author and that he is like one of like many authors that is writing under a gender ambiguous name, Riley. Um, and I had said on here the other day too, I, I was like, I don't know if it's a man or a woman author, male or female author, which I thought was interesting. And then I find out that it's like, he picked this name to be kind of gender ambiguous. He used to write underneath another name, but I don't think he was as successful because I looked up his older books and they're mysteries too. And I don't know how good they are, but uh, this is really good. And this is his third novel that he's written underneath this name. He wrote, um, the Final Girls, and then I don't know what the second one is called, and then I have it on Audible, but I haven't I haven't listened to it. And the third one is called um, it's what I'm listening to right now, Lock Every Door, and it just came out not too long ago. I actually, when I walked into Barnes and Noble the other day, it was like like right in the front like kiosk of like new um, releases. I guess I don't have to grab this anymore. I used to have to do that back in the day. Do you remember? So anyway, before I came, I was like. My shirt keeps on like writing up. It's feeling it's like it feels really weird. Anyway, um, I was like laying in the couch. I came home from my meeting um, to eat my Opta Via Bar, <laughs> my Opta Via Bar, and um, I was laying on the couch talking to Alex. He was in between shows. He like was finishing up. Um, what's the show called? Are you the one or whatever that show is on MTV that I'm like kind of like. I watch if he's watching it. That's kind of how I'm hooked on it. I think it's called Are You The One, actually. And it's on MTV. And then... It's like one of those little Fiat's. That car is actually pretty loud, isn't it? But anyway, for such a small little car. Um, and then he was watching The Real Housewives of Orange County. And I was, like, laying there with him watching it. <laughs> and I was like, I think I'm going to go... And this was, at, this was, like, 45 minutes ago. And I was like, I think I'm going to go and I'm going to go vlog and then I'm going to listen to my audiobook because I want to listen to a lot of it tonight. And he was like, okay. And then I just kept on laying there. I don't know why I'm going like this because it was actually this way. It doesn't really matter though, does it? And I was like, yep, I'm getting up to go vlog. He goes, okay. <laughs> we were like talking about what we want to do in Vegas and like the places that we want to go and stuff. I was like, yep, I'm going. And he goes, okay. <laughs> Oh. <sighs> and then finally I was like, okay, I'm getting up. I finally sat up and Pee Pee was like laying on my lap. I was just sitting there watching it. I was dazed out. Do you ever do that when you're watching TV? You just kind of like fade out. Yep, well, I'm going to go vlog now. <laughs> okay. <sighs> oh, what a day. Hasn't really been that eventful today. It's been a good day. God, this shirt is like it's driving me nuts. Anyway, like I said, I got my coffee, filmed videos, didn't really do a whole lot. Got ready to go to my meeting tonight. Um, we picked up one of our friends. It was so funny. On the way home, we got laughing so hard. We were talking about, I mean, this wasn't the funny part of it. We were talking about like true crime and all that kind of stuff because this friend of ours is really into it too and so I was telling her about the book that I had just read for the book club and she's like are you on Goodreads and I was like yeah I said we've never talked to people about that before and she was like are you on Goodreads and I was like yeah I said I love Goodreads and she was like oh my god I love Goodreads too and she's like I'm gonna have to follow you and I said my book club is on Goodreads she's like oh I'm gonna join and then I'm gonna come and I said then you have to come in for the live stream she goes I'm gonna join and then I'm gonna come in for the live stream and I said okay so I think we may have gotten a new member tonight. But we were talking, somehow we got talking about the Baumeister case. It's so warm in here. I don't want to turn the air on. Um, you can hear 
hear the crickets outside. Um, or the locust or whatever they are. Um, the, the cicada. Do you say cicada or cicada? I think it's cicada. But anyway, I don't know what they are outside. You can just hear them, you know? So anyway, I, uh, she didn't like know the whole story and so Tony and I were telling her about like how we met this friend of mine at a meeting and he was like oh we did go out there don't you remember we went out there and um, I was like I, I, I remember like maybe like now that you're telling me but no it doesn't and he was like yes we were there we went there for an after hours party it was you me and this other guy and I was like and Tony got real scared about the whole thing and our friend was like in the back seat she's like you were there <laughs> and I was like he said I was and I said, when I went there, she goes, you went there? And she goes, when did you go there? And I said, I went there for this paranormal investigation thing. And she was like, to her Baumeister's house, she goes, it's called Fox Hollow Farms now. And I said, well, it was called Fox Hollow Farms then too, I think. But yeah, it's, I said, I stay there. She goes, you were there overnight? And I said, I was there from like 8 p.m. to like 2 a.m. I said, there's a whole vlog. You can watch it if you want. And she was telling me all these stories about stuff that she knew. But she was telling me that she and... Uh, her husband and her mother-in-law, like, they drove up there because they, like, wanted to see it. This is really not funny, but it was funny the way that she was saying it. And her mother-in-law has since passed, but she's like, yeah, my mother-in-law thought she could talk to dead people and stuff. And she was like, we pulled... Okay, so if you don't know the Herb Baumeister case, I'm, like, slightly obsessed with the case. I slightly would be... Let's just put it this way. Next to the Golden State Killer, I'm like real obsessed with uh, the Herb Baumeister case. And Herb Baumeister was this guy that lived in Indianapolis. This thing keeps on sinking. I hate it. it. Drives me nuts. I mean, I'm glad that it works so well. It just works so well that it sinks. So anyway, um, Herb Baumeister was this guy. He was married and he had kids. And he lived at this place called Fox Hollow Farms. It was this horse mansion out in the middle of nowhere. And he owned these Save-A-Lot stores. And when his wife was out of town for the weekend, he would go to gay bars, pick up these guys. He killed 29 gay guys. He would pick them up and he would bring them back to his house and he would uh, strangle them with a pool hose and then he would burn them in this burn pile, okay? Well, I did videos on my channel called I Met a Serial Killer and they were really kind of clickbaity because I was just saying that I used to go out to some of the bars that he would pick people up in because back then, my friend and I, we were watching this documentary. This was after I got sober. He stopped in 90. He got, he got like, they caught him and then he fled to Canada and took his life in 96, I believe. And so my friend and I, they were doing this investigative reports on A&E with it. And my friend and I that I used to live with, she and I were watching it one night. We had gone to this bar. It's called OP's, Greg's here in Minneapolis. We had gone to it like, I mean, ton, hundreds of nights, right? And I was like, oh my God, like that could have been me and the kind of guys that he picked up then were like dark hair thin and like whatever you know and I totally and drunk always drunk and like I totally fit um the the what he was picking up and taking home except for the fact that many of them were like uh homeless people because he liked to pick up people that didn't have like any like family and then they wouldn't be missed supposedly is what they said. I mean, they don't know because they never got to talk to him, you know, because he killed himself first. But so anyway, um, or took his life. But um, so I made these videos and talking about how I thought I might have met a that he could have been like the first one I did. I think was about how. He could have been out there, but he could have been in there at some point that I was. And I just kind of told the story of who he was. And my friend and I were watching and we're like, oh my God, he was probably standing right next to us. And we didn't even know. I don't, I don't even remember. It's been so long since I made that video. But then Tanya and I were at a meeting one night and I saw a friend of mine that I used to party with back in the day. And Tanya was like talking to him and she was like, I'm just glad that you guys never ran into that Herb Baumeister and that, you know, like he didn't uh, take you guys back to his house. You guys could have ended up like him. And he was like, he looked at me and he goes, girl, did you not tell her? And I go, what? And he goes, that we went to an after hours party there. And I go, what are you talking about? And he was like, yeah, it was you and me and this other guy. And like all of a sudden I had this like memory of the three of us like doing something together, like hanging out something, but I don't remember like going, I didn't remember going to the house. Um... And so then I did that video and I told that story and um, 
then I got these people reached out to, well, this woman reached out to me and she arranges like paranormal investigations here in Indianapolis. She's really, really nice. Well, all over the state of Indiana and in the Midwest, she arranges them. She's super cool. And so she was arranging with the people that own the house, because there's people that live there now, which is bizarre to me that people live there. Um, and every time I do a video on this, I just have to tell you, I, I get tons of emails, okay, about stuff. It's really weird. I mean, to this day, I still get emails about people contact me and tell me stuff about the Herb Baumeister case and whatever. So anyway, she contacts me and she's like, would you like to come out and do a, par we're going to do a paranormal investigation out there. Would you like to do it? Well, I really did, but I didn't want to do it alone. I mean, when it comes to all this kind of stuff, like, I'm a lot of talk. Like, I'm very intrigued by it, but at the same time, it scares me. Like, I love going to psychics, but at the same time, it kind of makes me nervous. <clears throat> Partly because I really do believe in a lot of that stuff. So, she was like, would you like to do it? And I said, yeah, but here's the deal. Like, my friend, um, and I thought it was like this, I mean, it was planned, but I thought it was like this really highly planned thing, right? And so I was like, can I bring a friend with me? Because my friend, is she does these things and whatever. Meaning Melissa. Because my friend Melissa, she and her, our, well, it's our friend, but it's she and her friend, she and Aaron, our friend Aaron. But she, Aaron's been in some of my vlogs too. Well, Aaron was in the Fox Hollow Farms vlog because she ended up going with us. Because I was like, can I bring her too? And she's like, yeah, that's fine. So... Aaron and Melissa, they go to all these ghost hunting things. They do like the big ones, like the ghost adventure ones. And they've gone to like, you know the ones that are like hosted by Zach Bagans and stuff like that. Like they've gone on those tours and they like are serious, like they're real serious about it. Like they've gone to the psychiatric hospitals. I can't even think of what they're called. But anyway, um, one starts with a W. It's, so, it's like this big psychiatric hospital that closed down and it's like in Pennsylvania or West Virginia or somewhere. But Aaron and Melissa, they go to all these things. Like they're legit. Like they have all the tools and the instruments and all this kind of stuff, right? So she reached, <coughs> excuse me. So she was like, yeah, absolutely you can go or they can come. <coughs> well, at the last minute she ended up canceling the woman that organized it. She couldn't go. So she was like, but these people are really nice and whatever. So we go out there, and to do this thing, I was so scared that night, you guys. I just told this story on here not too long ago, so I was talking about the treats with Melissa. Because they brought, like, a cooler and snacks, and Melissa wanted to order pizza and all kinds of stuff. It's my highest viewed vlog ever. It's called Fox Hollow Farms, I think. It's just, and it has a, it, like, outside I took, like, a picture or the... It's of a screenshot from the, the vlog when we were in the backyard looking up at the house. The house is very daunting. It's very scary. You know, I've the thing is, I did the vlog and then I've talked about it on my vlog, but I've never really done like a reaction to what that experience was like for me. And I have to say that like that reaction or that that experience changed me. Like it changed in how I looked at things. It changed in how I looked at true crime. And it, because it was very sad. At the end, it was like, for, you know, the beginning of it, I was like, oh, this is kind of spooky, and we're in this house, and blah, blah, blah. And, you know, like, I think when you're in the element of that, it's just like, you know, you don't really think about it, right? But, like, at the end, I was like, this is really sad. Like, we were sitting there, and so the, it's an indoor pool, and the there's another part of the basement that looks into it. But that was the other thing, too, was that, like, I asked where the bathroom was at the end downstairs, and, like, they pointed this direction. I went in there, and I came out, and I was like, did there used to be, because they had, like, massage tables in there or something, and I was like, did there used to be, like, a sauna in there? And he was like, how do you know that? And I don't know how I knew that, but I knew there was a sauna in there, and I was kind of ready to go after that. I was like, let's get out of here, because then I kind of was like, I, maybe I do remember being here, you know, somewhere in the recesses of my brain. I don't know. I've always been kind of weirdly fascinated with this case. It makes me wonder if I wasn't out there at one point, you know? I don't know. You know, there's a couple times in my drinking history that I would come to out of a blackout and be like, literally, you guys, like, left in public places. I mean, he could have taken me out there and brought me back and just dropped me off in a public place and I wouldn't have remembered it. I mean, in all honesty. I mean, I came to out of blackouts in some weird places sometimes. It's very scary to me, you know, when I think about the fact that not just that situation, but many situations that I could have been dead, you know? But anyway, um, 
yeah, at the end, we were sitting there, and they were doing, like, the pendulum and stuff like that, and I just was kind of like, this is really sad, you know? Like, all these guys, like, this was the last place they ever were alive, and whatever, and, um, so I was telling my friend this story tonight about all of it, and she was like, she took her mother-in-law out there because her mother-in-law, she couldn't get on the property. The property's locked. Like, you can't, it's, like, you can drive into where the driveway's at, but then the driveway goes back probably, like, a half a mile. You can't, like, get up onto the property. You can see it from the road, but and I've actually showed that in vlogs, too, but you can't, like, get on the property, and they have horses out there and stuff now. It's beautiful. It's an absolutely beautiful property. But you can't get on there because they lock the front gate. Um, but so they like went in just like onto the driveway and she said her mother-in-law was like, this is what got us laughing. I mean, it's sad, but just the way she told it was so funny. She was like, I can feel all those boys out there. I can just feel the souls of all of those dead gay boys, all those poor dead gay boys. And she just kept on saying it over and over. And Tanya and I were just like almost like, dying and crying and laughter. Oh my lord, all those dead gay boys. <laughs> it is such a tragic story though, you know, and when I first told it, it was, well, one of the things that was sad to me was that I would get emails from people that would say like, I never met my uncle, but my uncle was one of the people that was killed out there and they found his remains like the years, they're still identifying people and still finding bones on that property. This creek runs through their property, and it's called Cool Creek, and it's like a huge creek in Carmel, Indiana. And um, so, like back in the day, like when all this would have happened, there were no houses around. It was like completely isolated by woods. There was fields next to the, it was all woods and fields next to them. There was no other houses around. It was like the only one out there. And then there's this creek that runs through the property. And um, now, and this is like Cool Creek, which is like a big deal. Like there's neighborhoods in Carmel called Cool Creek. And, um, but now the, next to it is the Monon Trail, which the Monon Trail runs from downtown. It, I think it used to be a train uh, track. It runs from downtown Indianapolis or the south side of Indianapolis all the way to the north. I mean, you could literally walk the whole thing. And so people walk, they run, they walk their dogs, they bike on there and everything like that. It's really a cool thing. And, um, but it runs right by the house. Like you literally can walk on the Monon and walk and you like are literally almost on their property because it walks, it goes along the Cool Creek in Carmel. And, um, they've also, on the one side, they have built um, a housing addition. And the, these houses, I'm telling you, literally sit like 100 feet from this house. Like the, if you were in this, like these, there's like three houses. Cause Melissa and I, when we first went there and looked in the driveway, we like drove to the next, it, it, this is in a vlog too. We like, there's something about a Cheetos box. She sees a Cheeto box in the trash or something. But we uh, like, we drove to the next street over to see if you could see through and you can. And Melissa was like, said something, she even says it on the vlog, or maybe I didn't put this on the vlog, I don't know. But she's like, do you think those people know like what their house backs up again? So, and I said, I don't know, maybe we didn't say it then, but we were talking about it later because I was like, you would think that they would have to be told that, you know? Like when they bought those houses. Um, but like literally the upstairs bedroom, like bedroom windows, but well, even the downstairs ones, look of these new houses, these housing I mean, these are like half a million to a million dollar homes too. They like literally look right onto Fox Hollow Farms, the house. It's creepy. It sits way back up against the woods and I don't know, it's just creepy. There was so much weird that happened that night that like I kind of didn't even at the time like. This one point, we were standing in the, where the sump pump was. Well, in the pool area or the pool pump and it was right outside the pool. Some of these paranormal investigators have like swam in this pool and stuff, you guys. And um, like not that time, but before this one guy, he had a picture, you guys, 
uh, that his girlfriend had taken of him, and it was like in the pool, and it, you could tell it hadn't been altered or anything. And he was like, um, he was like like this, like in the pool, and you could see like the waves and stuff behind him. And there was literally like a, a somebody's. I mean, and it wasn't even kind of like maybe somebody's face. Like it was somebody's face right behind him, like screaming in agony. It was like the and he had this on his camera from like the last. They had done it. They had come out there before, and. Um, it was like one of the, I don't know, we were standing in this pool pump room. I had kind of had it at this point. We were kind of, we were in the pool pump room and um, it was all of us like shoved in there. There was like five of us in there or something like that. And this one guy, so this guy that lived out there, he, he had lived in like it's not really a carriage house, it's an apartment that's attached to the house. And he had had a lot of like really weird stuff happen like when he lived there. Like he heard somebody slamming doors one night and this apartment was small. It was like a living room with like a little mock bedroom area and then like a bathroom. And um, the thing is, is that everything about that property is so isolated that like it would be spooky to live out there just even, just like if nothing had ever happened, you know what I mean? So that makes it that way on top of it. And then, um, so he came out there, he showed up and so he like helped give part of the tour and um, like he talked about, he like played these things. I think this is on the vlog actually. He played these things that he had recorded. He had actually recorded things when he was there that he had heard on his phone, like people talking and stuff. And, um, but when we were in, so he was in the pool pump room with us and he was like trying to agitate the spirit of her Baumeister. And he was like saying stuff like, um, like just taunting him. And, um, like, they had said that, like, when they had done that in the past, that's when stuff would happen in the pool room. So this pool room is apparently where Herb Baumeister would, like, keep the bodies and stuff like that. And, um, and the pool hose. And then, like, one of the things, like, we asked something about the pool hose, and they, and the guy that owned the house was like, no, that's the original pool hose that they used that he, that came with the house. And we're like, the one that he, he used? And he's like, yeah, I think so. I think, I think a lot of this is caught on the vlog, actually, because I actually vlogged the entire walkthrough of the house. And, um, and kind of our thoughts afterwards and stuff, because it showed us, like, driving home afterwards. But, um, we were in that pool room, and I'm, like, standing in a corner, kind of, like, well, it's hard to explain how I was standing because the, you know, but we're all in the dark and there's nobody by me. And I ended up getting a scratch on my arm. It felt like somebody just scratched my arm, but there was like nobody by me in that corner. And I tore out of there. I was like, I need to get out of this room. I need to get out of this room. Melissa ended up taking a picture of it. It was so weird, you guys. And um, there was another situation when I was like walking down the stairs. This was like when we first started the investigation. I was walking down the stairs from the kitchen. And I said to Melissa, I was talking to Melissa. There's like this guy in front of me and he like got to the bottom of the stairs. And I was saying, I was like, said something to Melissa cause I could hear her footsteps behind me. And I got to the end and I turned around like still talking to her and there was nobody there. There had been nobody on the stair stairway behind me, but I could, I could hear footsteps behind me. It was so creepy, you guys. Um, and then they said in the bathroom, like his main bathroom, I almost caught it, it stopped, it was at the end. They said in his main bathroom, his main bathroom was um, this like vortex to hell. That was like the main place that a lot of these paranormal people, like they set their stuff up with. And they like do this all the time. Like they had like two of the guys I was talking to, they had gone to another house like the night before and they do a lot of this stuff. It's very interesting. I would do it again. But it was, what is that place called that Melissa and Aaron, way, way something? I don't know. But it was funny because when we got there, they all got out of their car. These people were so nice, first of all. And I just, I don't know, that's like my social awkwardness. I just didn't know that they would be, but they were so incredibly kind. And this one guy knew that I was like kind of weirded out by the whole thing. And so he was so nice to me. I mean, for some, the other thing is, I don't know why, but we did the, almost the entire investigation in the dark. I don't know why we needed to do that, but it was like, we had like, it was low lit the entire time. 
I mean, not pitch black, but these people got me to go stand in the burn pile at 2 o'clock in the morning where this, like, spirit thing's supposed to run out at you, and they just wanted to sit there and record it, and they were like, it's, at some point it comes, it comes, they caught it, they had caught it on film before, and I was like, I don't know that I want to be out here on this burn, the burn pile doesn't exist anymore, but now it's like, you know, a brush of, like, shrubs and trees and stuff, because it's all grown over, because it's, like, the summer. The way they all found out about it was, like, Herbaumeister's son actually found one of the skeletons on the property, or a skull, I think, and Herbaumeister, whose dad was a doctor, told him it was from, like, his dad's office or something, and, like, they never told police that or anything, and then when, um, I think this, the same son, maybe, like, he had him at the lake house, this was right before he went to Canada, and finally, his wife said to the police, you can come on the property if you can get my son back safely. Well, this is what I've heard in documentaries. I don't know if that's the truth or not. But, uh, th and the thing is that there's not really any good books about it, which is really interesting to me. I don't know why I'm turning to drive through the bank when I go right up here to the light and turn right. But there's not really any good books on it. There's like one book about it. Um, maybe I'll write a book about it. I have to say this, that anytime I talk about it, or anytime I'm telling the story to people though, I get a little wigged out. Like I feel like it, there's a lot of negative energy around that story. I'm not really sure what it is. And when, um, uh, when I watch this one documentary I mean, none of the documentaries are that great, but I have to tell you that The Haunting of Fox Hollow Farms, which is one of them, that thing spooked the hell out of me. I don't know why. It's on YouTube. You can watch it for free. And I've watched all the investigative reports and the news coverage. I've literally watched everything that there is on this case. I know everything that there is about this case. But this one thing is talking about how when they found him, he had shot himself, but like the gun was away from his body and that there were like these crows that were going, some kind of bird or crow or something. My hair did look nice earlier today, but anyway. There were like these crows that were lined up going towards the beach. And um, like it looked like somebody had placed them there. Apparently he had like they think he may have, like, recorded a lot of this um, because there was a police officer in Canada that pulled him over the night before, and she remembered seeing, like, VCR tapes in the back seat, but she didn't, like, confiscate him, and she didn't search the car, and when they found his car, the tapes were gone. There's also a lot of speculation that he didn't do it alone, that there was an accomplice. Uh, this girl tonight, that was talking, our friend tonight that we were talking to, this girl, she was telling me that she had heard something about some professor, and I was like, I've never heard that before. Did you hear that? She's like, I, I saw it on, like, a show. Um, there's been, like, a Ghost Hunters that did an investigation there. I watched that, too. They didn't really find anything, but it was weird watching that show, knowing that they had been in the same place. I will say this, that when you're out there, there definitely is a feeling, there's an attachment feeling out there. Well, Tanya was telling her this tonight. When I drove out there originally, just Melissa and I, we like drove up on the property to see it. I, I don't know if that was, I think that was before we had um, planned to do uh, the paranormal investigation. But when we pulled up there to, like, so the driveway is kind of like this roundabout kind of, it's, it's not a roundabout, but it, you, like, can turn in, like, and turn out. And after that, I got, like, really, if you watch my vlogs a lot, like, on a regular basis, I got, like, and you remember this, I got sick, like, for a week after that, like, three to five days after I was sick. Like, really sick. And then I went out there again, like, a week later by myself and was vlogging and showing it, and I got really sick again. So, when we went out there for the paranormal investigation, I was like, and I've had all my life people tell me that I'm intuitive, that I'm an empath, that I, you know, things attached to me, and I was like, I'm not, I'm not even going to risk it this time. So, I went to uh, New Age People in Indianapolis, which was like a spiritual healing store. Okay, my battery died, and I was like really stressed out because I was looking through my fanny pack, and I was like, 
It's so hot, it's burning up. I was like, I don't think I have it with me. This is my other chapstick. Too below, honey. So anyway, I was talking about New Age People. I went to New Age People, which is like, um, uh, this spiritual healing store in Indianapolis, and I bought um, black, I think it's called tourmaline, tour tourmaline, something like that. And then I bought um, smudge spray, and I sprayed the hell out of myself. I, I stank so bad. And um, and then I wore my cross and my St. Christopher medal. Melissa was like, uh, we didn't see anything because you sprayed yourself with that stuff. I was like, well, that's fine by me. I don't honestly know what I would do if I really did see something out there. I think it would, you know, I think it would completely freak me out. The case is really interesting. I feel like there's a lot that's like unsolved about the case. And, and it, you know, and in all honesty, like it still lingers with me. I'm still interested in it. But it's like, after that night, I was kind of like done with it. Like I was kind of like, mm -hmm, like, and I've talked about that on here before. I was kind of like, ah, I mean, the thing that's really sad is that there's, they weren't able to identify all of the bodies because they would, they didn't have like a lot of the, like, like they could identify that they had 29 bodies, but they couldn't identify all of the people that it was. So there's a lot of bodies out there that people don't know who they were, you know, which is really incredibly sad about the whole thing. And, um, and you know, as well as all the, the family members that will never, I mean, this has been, so 96, so was it 2019, 96, 2006, you know, 23 years now, and these guys were in their 20s, so they'd be, I mean, they would, many of them would be my age to 10 years older than me, you know, and, um, which obviously I could have figured that out since it happened when I was, I also used to work with this girl that she told me that her parents had like a house by him. Um, I think his house was on Lake Max and Kucky. The, the lake house I was, lake place I was talking about the other night. And she was talking about how like there was always something very different about him. That he would always wear long pants and a long sleeve shirt. And that he was just really, really different. And Tanya actually knows somebody that used to work with him and said that he was really bizarre as well. Um... And then it, I, the my favorite murder podcast. If you guys have listened to that, they give a lot of details about that. You know, it's interesting. I was telling my friend tonight; she knew a lot about the case too. And I was like, "Yeah, I was when I was listening to my favorite murder con, uh, podcast. They were talking about him like urinating, and I said urinating on like uh, a teacher or a professor's desk. And she said it was at the BMV. I said what? She goes, "I told you I knew a lot about that case." She's like, "If you could ever go out there again," I said, "I don't think I would go out there again." And she goes, "You really wouldn't?" I said, "No." I said, "It makes me really sad." I said, "I don't know that I would go out there." again. There is just sent like, I, oh, I was saying this earlier about like, I've been told all my life that I'm an empath, that I'm an intuitive, that I have, you know, things attached to me. And that was why I got those things. Right. And the thing is, is that there is definitely an evil presence out there. I don't even know how to explain it. It's like, there is just such like a, a bad vibe to that whole property. And, um, and you know, like when he was telling kind of the story about the history of the house before they moved in there, they weren't the first owners that lived there. It wasn't like the first thing that had happened to the house, you know, and it's, and it's weird when you hear about like haunted places versus like people, you know, haunting a place. And, and like when I was sitting there, I was kind of wondering that that night, I, I, you know, I have not watched the vlog in so long. I don't even know that I ever did really watch the whole vlog back that I did that night other than putting it together because I had so many clips that I had to put together that night. But um, I'll link it at the end of the video if you guys want to go see it, if you haven't seen it already. Um, but I remember, like, thinking as we were standing there, you know, like, how much of this is just, like... I, Maybe this place is a magnet for, like, really just, like, you know, evil energy or, not, you know, negative energy or something like that, you know? Um, I don't know. I honestly struggle with the fact that people even live there today. I almost kind of feel like a place like that. 
don't know. I guess there's probably, you know, different thoughts about this from different, you know, I mean, yeah, maybe it can be like, you know, investigated and whatever, but at the same time, I almost kind of feel like the place should just be torn down and demolished. Waverly Hills. That's where Melissa and Aaron went. Waverly Hills. Oh, so this was what was funny. So when we showed up there, and I told this not too long ago, like, we get out of the car, and Melissa wanted to, like, bring, like, snacks and drinks and stuff like that, like Cokes, you know? And she had a cooler, and I was like, Melissa, nobody's gonna bring treats. And she was like, yeah, they always they always do this. And Aaron was like, yeah, Peter, they like all, this is what they do. Like, they bring all this equipment. I was like, Melissa, don't bring anything. She, Aaron and Melissa both had Ghostbusters. They had these leggings on that say boo. <laughs> this is what they wear, these ghost investigations. And then they have lanyards that say Ghostbusters on them and their names. I was so embarrassed. I was like, they're not gonna take us seriously. And Melissa's like, it's a ghost hunt, okay? <laughs> so anyway, she's like, but we need snacks, we need snacks. And so she brought a cooler and all this kind of stuff. And I was like, don't tell them that you have snacks. And so we get out and we're standing there and it's like this guy who was real nice and his girlfriend, they all like, once we like all got to know each other, it was like everybody was so nice. And they all kind of knew that I was the wimp of the situation. And so they were all super protective of me. Really, I mean, the whole group was just, I mean, they were so nice. And um, so we're all standing out there. And there's Aaron and Melissa in their like boo leggings and their Ghostbusters lanyards and stuff like that. And I think they had, I don't know what they had, t-shirts on. But anyway, so we're standing there and... Uh, probably Michael Myers t-shirts or something. <laughs> and, um, so they're like, just, we're kind of like, everybody's looking each other up, like, hey, how are you? I'm like, I'm Peter. And they're like, oh, it's nice. This is my friends, Melissa and Aaron. And they're like, oh, it's nice to meet you. And, and so there's this one guy and his girlfriend are like, kind of like talking about like where they, like what they've done. And they're like very serious. They're being very serious with us about it, you know? And they're like, have you guys ever done these before? And I go, well, I, I haven't. And they're like, oh, okay. And I was like, but my friends have. And the guy, the one guy, it was like another guy in the other group. Like there was one, two, three, four, five, six. Seven. I think there was nine of us, nine of us or one, two, three, seven of us or nine of us. I'd have to go back and look and see. But anyway, um, or maybe it was two guys and the one's boy, one's girlfriend, that was three, and then these two other guys, that's five, and then me and Aaron and Melissa, which would be eight. So I think there were eight of us, plus the guy that hosted it, and plus the guy that, um, the guy that, uh, what do you call it, lived in the carriage, or the, the lived in the apartment. Well, this other guy was gonna maybe come, I think they say this in the vlog, and he was the guy that allowed himself to get, like, caught, that, because his friend had gone missing, and so, like, he had come to the house and, like, got let go, and so he knew who it was and, like, reported it to the police and stuff, or he's the one that got the, the, I don't know, he tells it in the vlog, he's the one that got, like, the license plate number or something for her Baumeister, and they tracked, that's how they tracked him down, because they couldn't get, like, anyway, and he's also known as the I-70 killer, so, like, uh, he would drive, like, different cars, but anyway... He was going to come that night, too, but he, they said sometimes he comes and sometimes he doesn't because um, sometimes he gets kind of nervous about this case. See, I still think there's something people don't know out there about this case, but anyway. Um, and then I found out that he grew up right down the street from me. My neighbor that I, near where I live now, see, I don't even like to talk about this on here. She one night told me that he grew up right down the street with me. I can't say how she knows, but anyway... Just the whole thing. She may, she knows a family member of his. Let's just put it that way. I probably said it on here before at some point. But anyway, what was I going to say? Now I forgot. Oh, so we're standing there and it is hot. I got to turn on the air. So we're standing there and they're like, oh, well, have you ever done this before? And I was like, no, I haven't, but my friends have. And they're like, oh, really, where have you done? And um, Melissa goes, 
well, the last one that we did was Waverly Hills, and they were like, oh, really? Like, it was totally like a shift. Like, all of a sudden, it was like they took Melissa and Aaron very seriously. And they were like asking them, like, all the places they had done. Well, Melissa and Aaron have done like all of the big ones, right? They do all of these things. And, um, so yeah. It was, I will say, interesting, and it was interesting to see all of the ghost busting equipment, if that's what you want to call it, or ghost investigation, paranormal investigation equipment from the sticks, but those are like the least of it. I can't think of what those sticks are called, but um, they worked for me to, uh, they put this like light thing over the whole pool that if any movement like happened, it would track it immediately and it would start recording. And then they did like sound, they put sound speaker things all over the house. They, I mean, they did some like really, really intense stuff and they did like, it wasn't just like the meters and the Ghostbuster thing. I mean, it was really serious deal. And, um, she asked me afterwards, like the woman that organized it, she's like, oh, we always have one. So I need to reach out to her again because I'd like to do another one. She was like, I think next time if I do it, I'm going to put it on my Peter Mon channel. But um, she was like, um, if you want to do any more, just let us know. And I was like, yeah, sure. Just let me know when. And, um, and then I kind of got like real weird about it for a while. And um, then I got over that and I was like, well, I guess I would do it again. I don't know. There's, like, some I think I would be really... I would never... Like, Melissa really wants to do the Lizzie Borden house. And I was like, I don't know that I could do that. Like, that scares me. That whole story scares the hell out of me. I just get really, really strong vibes about stuff. Um, and so... I don't know. Sometimes I just... I. I just get real weird feelings. I just got overwhelmed with sadness while I was out there at the end, especially. And, um, there's so much to the case, you know, that's so crazy. And, um, but, oh, the one thing was when we were out there, the guy that owns the house, who, he had, like, kids that had graduated from high school. They had just graduated from high school, and they were, like, living, like, lived in the upstairs. I was like, I, there is no way I would live in this house as a teenager. There is, I would have been so scared to death. Um, I just would have been terrified. My house growing up was like out in the middle of nowhere anyway, my dad's house. And I was terrified there and there was nothing weird there. Um, so I don't know. What are you guys saying? You think I should do more investigations? There's enough in Indiana. There's a lot of things in Indiana. There's House of Blue Lights. There's all kinds of things in Indianapolis that you can go do. That flag blowing in the wind lightly is so pretty. Anyway, do you guys get kind of weirdly obsessed with certain cases? It's a good thing I don't live in California. A lot of these cases are in California. I mean, it just seems to me like, I, you know, I just read the Zodiac Killer for my book club, and then on the heels of that, reading, or no, 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 no. Well, the Golden State Killer and then the Zodiac, reading those, they took place in very similar areas. And then what was another book that we read that was um, kind of like that as well? I don't know. You know, it's interesting to me. It's like uh, with the John Wayne Gacy house, like they completely demolished it, but they had to because they had to take out the whole first floor to get to the basement, to get everybody out, get all the bodies out. Um, that book, Killer Clown, by the way, was really, really good. Um, so if you don't know, I have a book club called Peter's Book Club, and it is an all true crime book club. We're changing the name as of January. Um, yeah, so, and there may be a, a podcast coming soon. There may be, just a little hint, hint there for you. It will not replace the blog. It's com something completely different. So anyway, um, but you know, when you read those cases and stuff like that, it makes you like, I don't know, like that I could, uh, to live in that house. I just think it would, it would kind of weird me out a little bit. I know they wanted to use it to, like, do, like, a documentary or a movie or something like that. I, I'm kind of surprised, honestly, 
that there hasn't been like some legit documentary done out there. I mean, the story is so in depth and the house is completely intact. It looks inside exactly how it did when he was there, except for the furnishing is different. Um, but like nothing has changed, you know? I'm really surprised they haven't done some huge documentary on it. And I think, like, knowing the people that own the house, having met him and stuff like that, I totally think that he would allow that to happen. I really, really do. I think he even mentioned to us while we were out there that he was wanting to, like, I don't know, do something, like, have something about them uh, do a movie about it or something like that. You know, it's kind of weird to me that we're, like, doing this paranormal investigation. Like, his wife was upstairs, and she just was, like... And he was, like, so my wife's upstairs, so she's just watching TV and stuff. And, he, and she was, like, okay, hey, guys, or something. I mean, she was real nice, right? But we didn't see her. She just shouted down. And his kids were gone, but he only does tours, like, maybe twice a year or something like that. So I don't know how we lucked into being one of the people that did tours on this thing, but... Um... Like, that was one of the things that was, like, overwhelming for me. I was like, I don't, I just don't know how I could live in this house, you know, knowing what had happened here and all of that. I just don't think I could. I just really, really don't think that I could live there. But I don't know, you know. I also wonder what they, you know, and this is really... I, Okay, well, if we're going to talk about the whole thing as a speculative case, I wonder how much they paid for this house, you know, compared to, like, market value of what it was had that not happened there. I mean, it's a ginormous house. I mean, it's huge. It's an estate. And the, one of the things that's the coolest about the house is that it has actually this... It, somebody said to me, carriage house, but it's not a carriage house. It's, like, legit, like, this... I think it used to be stables, and they turned it into offices or something like that. But, I mean, it is, like, a freestanding house. It has, like, several rooms in it. Like, we walked in there, but, like, that wasn't part of where we did the investigation. And it was all, like, lit up, and this guy had his office, and it was beautiful. It was absolutely beautiful, you know? And um, then there's, it's like, they have horses out there, and, you know, it's all surrounded by the woods. Now, I will tell you, when I watched the documentary called The Haunting of Fox Hollow Farms, there was, I did not know tonight when I started this, I was going to do an entire vlog about Fox Hollow Farms, so I apologize, but anyway. Um, I would like to actually know more about it. I would like to find out more about it, because I think there's, there's things out there that... I get the feeling, kind of, like the case was just, like, nipped in the butt. Like, they just were like, okay, we're not, like, this is a closed case. We know who did it. We're moving on now, whatever. There were a lot of issues between the counties, because the people that went missing were from Marion County, which is Indianapolis, and the house sits in Hamilton County, which is Carmel. And when you watch this one investigate, I guess there were a couple documentaries. There was one documentary I watched where there was a lot of issues between counties. So I kind of wonder if stuff wasn't lost in that. There was one investigator here in town um, that actually was the lead investigator on the case, and he was also, like, followed up with the I-70 stuff. And he has, like, a... He looks like a sheriff or something like that. He's a private investigator now, but... He's in one of the documentaries, and, um, like, he was trying to get this thing moving long before it ever did, and I think that a lot of it was the county that was kind of, like, not moving on it, and things could have been found out a lot sooner than they did. Um... I think one of the things that's creepy is that he always did it when his wife was out of town. I mean, like, and then she just comes home with the kids from the weekend, and they're, he's like, oh, yeah, how was your weekend? Oh, me? Well, I went for a swim in the pool. You know what I mean? It's like, I don't know. It's like, and you think about how he, like, went to these bars, and he picked up these people and brought them all the way back there. And, you know, I drive right by there a lot when I'm vlogging at night. I drive right by the street that you have to turn to go over there. And I think to myself often, you know, this was the last, because now it's all developed out there, but it wasn't, it wouldn't have been developed, you know, 30 years ago or 20 years ago. And I think to myself as I'm driving out there, this is the last place these guys saw, you know, like this was like they were driving down the street and they had no idea what was going on, you know, and the next thing they know they're in this house and they're dead, you know, it's so tragic. So, I need another case. I just finished reading uh, 
American Predator by Maureen Callahan. That was about the, uh, the Israel Keys case. And that's another interesting thing. You know, I was telling Tanya and our friend that tonight, like, Lauren Sperrier, who went, or Sperrier, or whatever her name is, I talked about this the other night on here, but she went missing, you know, in Bloomington, Indiana, and they're like, they think he may have done it, you know, because he was in Indiana that day, and they threw down her picture and at him, like, this is in the book, at least how it's portrayed, and they said, did you kill her, and he said, um, something about, that'll be work for you, or something like that. It's crazy when you think about I read some estimate. I don't know where it was. This seems kind of astronomical to me. But then I read some estimate. It's either a hundred or a thousand. And I know everybody's gonna be like, it's a hundred, but I think I'm almost thinking it's a thousand. That at any given time there are this many serial killers active in the world. And you think about that. A thousand active serial killers. But then you know like I go to like when you go to Walmart and you see the missing people on there and stuff like that and you think about all these missing people and it's like well what if all of these people were taken you know or you know like it's just so sad isn't it and you wonder like I don't know what happened to these people and there's a lot of things that could have happened to them that have nothing to do with a serial killer but then you wonder as well you know it's like with Israel Keys and the case I just read like most of the people that he, they were missing people they were missing adults that Nobody knew what had happened, you know? And his attitude about it was when they were like, they asked him in the book, they said, or they, the FBI agent said about, because they wanted him to give him like more names of people he had like um, killed. And they said, um, like, you're a father, because he, he has a daughter. And they said, um, who at this point would probably be like 18 or 19. And they said, um, what, don't you, uh, but I'm not a believer in exposing the family of, um, those people unless they are, um, unless they've come out like the BTK killer when we read her book, that Carrie Rolson book or, you know, people like that. Um, but they said, you have a daughter, like if this was you, and, and this is crazy that they're talking about the psychopathy of a serial killer and that he's, you know, all this kind of stuff. But then they, at the same time, they're like, you know, they're like pleading to his empathetic side of which he has none. You know what I mean? But they actually do discuss that in the book. And they said that he, he, he does have the ability to feel feelings. That's not necessarily true. And that the psychopath of today is different than the psychopath of a hundred years ago. And that we have that, that they are able to mimic feelings and almost feel those feelings. It's interesting. They go into a lot of discussion about that in the book, but, um, that he was almost able to turn it off and turn it on. But they said to him, um, wouldn't you rather know what it, like you're a father, don't you want to know what happened to your child? And he said, no. He said, I would much rather think that they were off on a beach somewhere in Mexico and then run away than to think that they had been, you know, brutally killed or whatever he says in there. I can't remember what he says, but you know what I mean? I raped or killed or something like that, I think. You know what I mean? Like it's, <sighs> okay. <laughs> So, you know, he died with a lot of his secrets and didn't give people closure on what had happened to their kids, which I think is, you know, cruel. But let's just be for real. I mean, he was cruel. He was, that's what he was, you know, serial killer. Anyway. Oh, it's going to stop. Hold on. Okay. Ooh, that was a long discussion about Fox Hollow Farms tonight. I don't know what else I would have talked about. That's what we talked about the whole ride home. It's scary to think though, isn't it? You know, what's out there. With Israel Keys, he even says to them like, why can't I remember how he gets pulled over? He gets pulled over. Well, I don't want to tell you guys how in case you want to read the book. But he gets pulled over. And it's just by chance. I mean, it is just absolutely by chance, right? And he says, if I had never gotten pulled over, I would never have gotten caught. You guys would never have found me. 
And when you read the book, you know it's true. Like, he had gotten away with so many things that nobody, they had no clue. They didn't even know that, like, these people that were missing were actually killed. I mean, there were no bodies. There was nothing. Like, and it's so terrifying to think about that, you know? I don't know. The whole thing is so scary. So, anyway... I don't know if I would go back out there again. When I watched this one documentary on the Fox Hollow Farms thing, they had the wife that lives there now. She threw her bedroom window. I think it was her. I don't... Yeah, because I think they're the most recent people that have lived there. She saw this guy walking to the woods... And he was, like, standing in the yard or something looking into the house. Or he was just walking to the woods or something. I don't know. Like, the house, like, right behind the house is the woods. It's so scary back there. I was in the woods at 2 o'clock in the morning. And this where it's just, I didn't, where the burn pile used to be. The burn pile, you know what I'm talking about, okay? So, anyway. She's standing in the window. And she sees this. I think this is The Haunting of Fox Hollow Farms. That's on YouTube. I mean, it's not the world's best documentary, but it was scary as hell to me, and I watched it in the pitch black by myself. So, um, she's sitting up in her window, like, looking down. I think it's in the living room or the bedroom or something, and she sees this guy, and you can't, she couldn't see from his waist down. All she could see was, like, from his waist up. And he, like, turned and looked at her or something, and then he walked off into the woods, like, towards the burn pile. And they thought, like, he... Like, in the, in the documentary, they speculate who he is or something. I don't know. And they try to get him, but, but they, nothing happens. They have, like, a shaman come out there. And, like, this uh, Marilee Isaacs, who's, like, this famous psychic here in town. Um, Marilene or Mar Marilene or Marilee Isaacs. I don't know what her name is, but she's, like, this famous psychic here in town anyway. And they have all these people out there and do all this kind of stuff. And they don't find anything out. They talk a lot about, like, the haunting of it. It's supposedly haunted like crazy. When we were, like, in the closet, like, this closet in the bathroom that's supposed to be, like, the vortex to hell. I mean, it's kind of hard to sit there and really, like, believe that when you're sitting there and there's, like, a tube of Colgate on the counter, you know, and his shoes, his slippers pushed up against the wall, you know, like, the guy that lives there. And, I mean, it's it doesn't seem like like there's any vortex to hell right there, you know what I mean? But um, it, they've speculated like what this was all about. Like was there a deeper thing to this? Was he not just a killer but was this some kind of like, you know, something else? It's very, you know, I don't know. It's very creepy. So anyway. Now I'm completely creeped out and I'm ready to listen to my scary book. Lock all, lock every door by Riley Sager, and I'm ready to end this saga tonight. I'm talking about Fox. I always just get so creeped when I talk about it. I don't know why it just like weirds me out. So anyway, all right, I'm gonna get off here now. I know this is a little shorter than usual, but I'm gonna get off here now and um, end this vlog so I can listen to my audio book and um, get centered again. I'll probably listen to some happy music for a little bit. Be happy. Don't worry. <laughs> for a little bit and um, they'll probably put that song someday in a horror movie just to ruin it for everybody but anyway I don't love that movie that song anyway that song's stupid alright you guys don't worry be happy do you know how stupid it is it's as stupid as that Beach Boys Kokomo song do you remember that song I used to love that song back in the day way down in Kokomo Anyway, um, I hope you guys enjoyed this vlog. I never say that, do I? I never say that. Anyway, I hope you guys are having an amazing Wednesday, unless you have other plans. But like I always say, do not have other plans. Enjoy your day. Make the most of it. Do something today that's different. Take a risk. I don't know. Do something fun for yourself. Dedicate it. Dedicate today to you. <laughs> that sounded corny as hell. Anyway, just have fun today, you know? Live it today as if it's your last. And uh, we're, life is not a dress rehearsal. And um, if nobody else told you this today, I love you. 
pass it on to somebody else. Make sure that you look at yourself in the mirror every single day and say to yourself, I love you, I love you, and you are important, and um, you are deserving of good things. And most importantly, like I just said, make sure to pass it on to somebody else and let them know how much you care about them as well. And I love you guys, and I will see you to, did I say, what did I say? Make sure that you let somebody know that they, how important they are to you as well. Did I say that? That's what I meant to say. Okay. And I will see you guys tomorrow. Well, I love you. I will see you guys tomorrow. Bye. Love ya.